Hi, this is the second lecture in our unit on uh, mood disorders and psychotic spectrum disorders. So in the last lecture, we talked about the mood spectrum as a whole, uh, the ways in which mood disorders can affect most areas of functioning, not just mood and affect, but also um, energy levels, sleep, appetite, interest in sex, self-esteem, a wide variety of um, widespread effects. We also covered in that lecture the many ways in which major depressive disorder is heterogeneous. It has varied presentations at the symptom level, so multiple different combinations of the nine symptoms that are diagnostic of depression, some of which actually reflect alterations on both ends of a spectrum. So for example, energy or appetite loss or appetite increase, insomnia or hypersomnia. At the end of the lecture, we talked about some of the implications of this heterogeneity for how depression is experienced by patients. Depression is also heterogeneous in terms of chronicity, severity, and recurrence. And this fact has led to really widely varying prevalence estimates for major depressive disorder with higher prevalence estimates generated from longitudinal prospective studies where people are followed over time to see how many of them become depressed over a long period, something like 40 years. We also discussed how that heterogeneity at the level of chronicity, severity, and recurrence results in major depressive disorder being both a very severe chronic lifelong disturbance that can result in severe disability or even death, ranging from that to um, what's sometimes been called the common cold of psychiatric illnesses, something that's extremely common, minor for the majority of people who experience it and likely to go away on its own without a lot of intervention. So today we're gonna to talk about a debate in the field that relates to this heterogeneity at the level of severity, chronicity, and recurrence. Because depression is so heterogeneous, this has led some people like Jerome Wakefield, whose article you read for this class, to question, question whether we're over-diagnosing depression and whether our diagnostic criteria for depression do a good job of distinguishing between normal adaptive sadness and a psychiatric disorder. So we're going to start this lecture with a video, um, an interview from 2012 with Jerome Wakefield, who wrote the article that you had to read for class. I'm going to pause this. Sorry, guys. OK. Here's something depressing. The Centers for Disease Control says roughly one in 10 Americans today is depressed. The land of opportunity apparently offering a lot of opportunity for misery. It really started to take hold for me in my 40s. I would have these depressive episodes and they increased in frequency and in intensity. Like in the middle of Starbucks, in the middle of a Starbucks line, I would just like start welling up with tears. Novelist Lewis Byard had no obvious reason to cry. In fact, he seemed to have every reason in the world to be happy. I was living a, a really good life by my standards. I was doing the work I wanted to do. I, I had people to love. I had a nice house. I had all the sort of markers of, of, of happiness, right? And it still wasn't sinking in. Depression has been recognized as a disorder, a medical disorder, since as early as medicine started. Jerome Wakefield is a professor at the New York University School of Social Work. Basically for 2,500 years, there is a tradition in which people have recognized that at times something goes wrong with people's ability to process loss or it goes wrong where they're just generating sadness in an unstoppable fashion that immobilizes them. People have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. They have a change in their appetite. Their energy level's low. They start to have a lot of negative thoughts about themselves. It's like wearing a dark pair of glasses. And more and more Americans are seeing the world through those glasses, says psychiatrist Richard Friedman at New York's Weill Cornell Medical College. The rates of depression have been going up. Um, over the last several decades in most industrialized nations. We're talking something like 27 million Americans? Yes. Several studies claim rates of depression are three times today what they were just two decades ago. If one out of 10 people are taking medications and then many other people are feeling it, you've got something that's spread throughout the culture. It used to be called sadness. But as usual in this complicated field, not everyone agrees. Professor Wakefield says there is no real spike in depression, just a spike in diagnosing it. What's happened is that the definition 
of depressive disorder has gotten so generalized, covers so many forms of sadness, that these figures have exploded and encompassed many people who are having normal reactions to loss. When you realize that depression has left you nowhere to go, when you've lost interest in everything, Wakefield says just turn on the TV and you'll see commercials bent on convincing people that they are depressed. Depression hurts in so many ways. Sadness, loss of interest, anxiety. Symbolta can help. We have direct-to-consumer advertising where pharmaceutical manufacturers can tell the public, if you experience sadness, you know when you feel the weight of sadness. You're unhappy with your child and your spouse. You're uh, not yourself for a period of time. Things just don't feel like they used to. These are some symptoms of depression. You should see a physician. You may have X disorder. Now, I'm not saying that these don't have sometimes a good result of certain people who need help going in for help. But it also reshapes our cultural view of what is normal range of motion that individuals can handle and what needs to get medication or needs to get professional help. So it's no longer acceptable to be sad? Well, I think we are getting to that point. And people are taking action, or at least they're taking medication. To put it in perspective, more Americans take antidepressants than go to the movies each week. An estimated 30 million. That's about double what it was just 15 years ago. You'd think we'd all be deliriously happy. But we are not. And University of Pennsylvania psychologist Robert DeRubis may have hit on why. He's co-authored a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association examining how well antidepressants work for mild to moderate cases. We found that the advantage offered by the medicine over the benefit that came just from the placebo was very small. So the medication didn't work any better than sugar pills? Uh, worked on average very little better than sugar pills, that's correct. Lewis Byard was in that mild to moderate group and was prescribed a drug called Lexapro. I was concerned that I, it was going to turn me into this smiling zombie of bliss, you know, with a cloud of Disney birds around my head, and I thought it would alter me in some fundamental way. But in fact, something very different happened. Nothing at all, or so it seemed. Was there a change? I don't know. That's the thing. People would ask me that very question. How's it working? I'd be fine, I guess. I don't know. There uh, wasn't a eureka moment? There where was you no said eureka moment. The gray the is gone. <laughs> burst open into the, into the room. The answer to the question, do antidepressants work, depends who you give them to. If you give them to people who have sadness but not depression, they aren't going to do anything because they don't have the disease for which the drugs are designed. And in general, if you give them to more severely depressed people, they're highly effective. But, he says, unfortunately, those people, the severe cases, too often don't get help, while the mildly depressed and the just plain sad end up on an antidepressant. One possible problem, 65% of all such prescriptions are written not by psychiatrists, but by primary care doctors. Who prescribed it? My primary care physician, or let me correct myself, I went to my primary care physician. She was on vacation that day, so I was prescribed the pill by another doctor in the same practice. Somebody who knew you? No. No, they didn't know me at all. And it was actually the most efficient medical transaction I think I've ever had. <laughs> I walked in, I said, oh, I've been talking to my therapist, right. maybe need a, a pill. And within 20 seconds, I had a prescription for Lexapro. And I think even a prescription for three refills after that. So I was ready to roll. That was four years ago. Byard says he feels much better today, but has no idea if Lexapro had anything to do with it. So have you stopped taking antidepressants? That's a very good question, Susan. <laughs> I am still taking my Lexapro every day. And I ask myself why, because I, I don't necessarily think the pill works. And I think it's the same reason an agnostic would go to church. She, just in case, I'm going to cover my bases. He's not alone in his uncertainty. Depression today is almost as big a mystery as it was at the dawn of medicine. So we don't know why people get depressed. That's, we don't know what happens in their brain. So the, area, the answer is, 
we do not know. We are putting drugs into people's bodies that may be helpful, and that's necessary sometimes in medicine. But if you ask, do, can we say for sure what the mechanism is that caused the depression and by which these drugs are helping and what the long-term effects if you stay on it for endless years, uh, we just don't know. That's the reality. Okay, so some takeaways from that video and also kind of takeaways from the reading. So as they said in the video and as Dr. Wakefield wrote in his article, rates of depression have been increasing um, since about the 1990s, um, increasing even more in the 2000s. That video that we just watched was from 2012, but it still holds true today. Rates of depression are still increasing. So researchers like Dr. Wakefield and other researchers who were interviewed, including Dr. Derubis, who studies treatment outcomes, have started asking the question, how much of these increases in depression are true increases in depression versus how much of it is increases in either the rates of normal sadness, the number of people who are actually sad, or in the number of people who are kind of mistaking normal sadness for pathology and thinking that normal adaptive sadness or alterations in mood that come with life events and stressors is a psychological illness. So the one of the reasons why this is important is for scientific research and studying what treatments are effective for depression. If we wanna learn what depression is and how to treat it, so for example, with SSRIs, as they talked about in the video, it makes sense to ensure that the people that we're studying really are depressed. This is an issue of validity, um, going back to lecture five, when we talked about assessment and diagnosis, also research. So if our diagnostic criteria for depression are so loose that they're able to capture both people with a life-threatening illness and people with essentially the common cold, it's hard for us to say what depression truly is and isn't. And as Dr. Jarubis' meta-analysis of depression treatment outcomes showed, it's hard for us to know if our treatments are effective if we're giving them to people who aren't really sick. As that meta-analysis showed, um, antidepressant drugs don't really have any effect greater than the placebo effect for people who meet criteria for depression but only have mild or moderate symptoms. These people in these studies also tended to have less recurrent depression and depression that didn't last as long. So these were people who did not have severe chronic or recurrent depression. Researchers like Dr. Derubis um, posit that the reason that drugs are less effective for these people is because they, not that they have mild depression, but that they actually don't have depression at all. They have normal sadness that is being misdiagnosed as depression. So this isn't to say that mild depression isn't a real thing. All illnesses exist on a spectrum and you can have a mild case of true depression. The issue is that with our current diagnostic criteria, we're not really able to distinguish mild depression from just normal sadness. So researchers like Dr. Derubis and Dr. Wakefield have argued that we really need to make sure that we're considering, in the case of Dr. Derubis, how severe chronic and recurrent the symptoms are because the most severe, most chronic and most recurrent forms of depression are the types of patients, the forms of depression where we actually can see a separation between placebo and active treatment. So these are patients who we should be studying for clinical trials of depression treatments, both medication and psychotherapy. In his article, Dr. Wakefield argued that when we're trying to understand whether something is depression or adaptive sadness, we need to take into account the person's life circumstances and ask, would the average person, would a typical person be sad if their life looked like this, if this thing just happened to them? Is this a normal adaptive sadness response or is this an example of harmful dysfunction? a deviant experience of sadness that causes danger, distress, and dysfunction. So I've been throwing around the term normal sadness a lot. Um, getting back to the anxiety unit, we've talked a lot in the anxiety unit about how anxiety and fear are normal, helpful emotions in certain situations. When an emotional response or a behavior is beneficial in some way or when it's the appropriate response to an environmental situation, we call this an adaptive response. Adaptive in the sense that having this response would have helped our ancestors survive and pass on their genes in our ancestral environment. As we'll get into more at the end of this lecture, people vary in the extent to which they feel certain emotions, how likely they are to feel them um, across contexts kind of how sensitive their trigger for that emotion is in response to the environment. People also differ in how strong their experience of these emotions are and how capable they are of regulating those emotions, of functioning while they're having those emotions. 
and differences in this tendency to feel sadness in response to a wider variety of situations, feel sadness more strongly when it happens, and have a harder time functioning and managing our sadness reflects a predisposition to experiencing depression, just like feeling anxious in response to more situations, having a stronger anxiety response, in the case of anxiety, having a better ability to learn to have an anxiety response in the future and having difficulty regulating anxiety is a predisposing factor for anxiety disorders. So I'm making the case that there are certain situations in which sadness is adaptive and to try to figure out what sadness is kind of for, why we have the capability to feel sad, it can help to ask what are some of the situations that would make almost anyone feel sad? So think about that for a second. Back in the 90s, um, under DSM-4, there was what was known as the bereavement exemption exception for diagnosing major depressive disorder. If someone was experiencing symptoms of depression enough to meet criteria for depression, but they had experienced bereavement or the loss of a loved one um, in the last two months, according to the old diagnostic scheme for depression, they couldn't be diagnosed with depression because that was considered to be a normal adaptive response to losing a loved one. Some researchers in response to this bereavement exception asked the question, why is it just death? There are other situations that universally provoke sadness, things like breakups, being fired, um, major life changes, getting a severe chronic illness or getting um, a fatal diagnosis. If someone experiences five out of nine depressive symptoms in those situations, who are we to really say that that's a pathological response? Most people would feel that way. Rather than broaden the exception, like some researchers wanted, in the fifth edition of the DSM, which is the one that we are currently using, the bereavement exemption was actually taken away. So now you can diagnose someone with depression in the immediate aftermath of losing a loved one. So Jerome Wakefield's harmful dysfunction model is kind of based on this idea of sadness as an adaptive response to needs not being met in some way. You might recognize this figure from one of our early lectures where we talked about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Clinic, or sorry, counseling psychologists argue that humans function optimally. We can be our best, happiest selves when all of our needs are being met. Our basic needs, like the physiological need for air, water, food, shelter, our safety needs, the need for a home, for steady income, um, for good physical health, and then higher order needs, a need for social connection, love and belonging, a need to have close relationships in your life, and then the need for status, respect from other people and from society. So again, most disorders that we've talked about involve extreme manifestations or inappropriate manifestations of adaptive behaviors and emotions. So Wakefield, using the harmful dysfunction model, argues that when we're diagnosing someone with a mental illness, we should consider whether the emotions and behavior that they're experiencing are truly dysfunctional, in addition to considering whether they're distressing, dysfunctional, and dangerous. As we talked about in the fear and anxiety lectures, you wouldn't diagnose someone with an anxiety disorder if they were living in a war zone, because in that case, their anxiety is justified. It makes sense. It's adaptive. Anyone would feel that way. So people like Dr. Wakefield are asking the question, why do we diagnose people with depression when they've just lost a loved one or when they're extremely lonely? Dr. Wakefield has argued, and what that video was kind of implying is that rates of depression and of sadness are kind of rising at the same time. And a question we could ask is, are people really getting more depressed or are there just more people in the world and specifically in our country whose needs aren't being met, who are maybe having an adaptive sadness response to a lack of love and belonging in their life in kind of an increasingly um, isolating social environment or people who aren't having their esteem needs met because there is just a lack of stable working class jobs for many people. So researchers like Dr. Wakefield and others have argued that we really need to take into account the social context in which people are living in deciding whether they actually truly have a disorder. So in the last lecture, we talked about how we need to maybe take into account severity, chronicity and recurrence in deciding whether someone truly has depression. In this lecture, we're also going to consider the circumstances in which they're living and asking the question, would anyone be feeling sad or feeling depressed in these circumstances? So one example of the relationship between unmet, unmet needs and major depressive disorder prevalence is poverty. The map here on 
the left shows the um, prevalence of depression by state. The map on the right shows the poverty rate by state. As you can see, places where poverty is highest, like where we live, the deep south, rates of depression are correspondingly higher. And in the more prosperous areas of the country, um, rates of depression are lower. So again, we need to ask the question, does poverty make people depressed or does poverty mean that people have unmet needs and they're having an adaptive normal sadness response to that unfair and difficult life situation? We don't know. And I'm not saying that poverty and depression aren't related, but I am saying that with the relatively loose criteria that we use to diagnose depression now, it can sometimes be hard to tell the difference. And that is a problem for our understanding of what depression is and isn't. And also it's a problem for our development of treatments for depression. So yeah, people, even at the neighborhood level, so within a city, people living in the more low income areas of their city are twice as likely to be depressed as people living in higher income areas. So this isn't just a state level problem, this is really a problem with poverty. Another example of factors that drive increases in depression that may or may not really be maladaptive is the national response to COVID-19. So rates of depression exploded during COVID-19. Some of this increase almost definitely reflects normal adaptive sadness. People were grappling with uncertainty, fear, isolation. A lot of people lost their jobs, so they were stressed about having an income. Their esteem needs were also not being met. And many, many thousands of people were bereaved. So during COVID, what we are seeing happening or what we saw happening is a national increase in both major depressive disorder and adaptive sadness. Um, and it's kind of up to psychologists and researchers to try to disentangle those two things. So I'm gonna take a quick detour into Darwinian medicine and really try to nail down the definition of what is adaptive sadness. And at the end of this lecture, I'm going to propose an etiological model of depression that can help to explain both the difference between adaptive normal sadness and depression and how adaptive normal sadness can turn into depression for some people. So first, again, sadness is an adaptive response to life stressors, loss, failure, rejection, social rejection, and romantic rejection. And the emotion of sadness is a pretty human universal thing. And there's also kind of a universal set of behaviors that are associated with sadness, just like there's a universal set of behaviors that are associated with fear and anxiety. So one example is what's known as illness behavior. When people are depressed, they have less energy. They may eat a lot more or they may eat a lot less. Um, they may sleep a lot more or sleep a lot less. And all of these alterations in energy level, appetite, and sleep are similar to the alterations in appetite, energy level, and sleep that people have when they're sick when they're fighting off a virus or a bacterial infection. So some researchers, researchers have posited that the function of depression, sorry, the function of the behavioral response to sadness, which again is an adaptive response to loss, failure and rejection is to conserve our physiological resources. We evolved in an environment where our early ancestors really, really relied on their relationships with their group members. So in many cases, when people were dealing with social rejection or bereavement, they were also potentially dealing with a situation where they had less physical resources because they had fewer people to rely on for survival. Sadness behaviors like crying, seeming dejected, seeming withdrawn may also be adaptive because they elicit caretaking. When we see someone who looks sad or when we see someone crying, it's kind of natural to want to help them and to see how you can make them feel better. So illness behavior in depression may be a way of eliciting caretaking during times of depleted physiological resources. Because sadness and depression is often in, um, precipitated by some kind of social rejection, some of the withdrawal symptoms of depression, so low self-esteem, not engaging as much, not enjoying activities as much as you used to, not being very motivated to try new things or go out and socialize, could be an adaptive response to having experienced a social rejection. If you just had a big rupture in your social group, it makes sense to kind of lay low for a little while, try to avoid further conflict, let things blow over. Um, in terms of the low self-esteem symptoms, thinking negatively about yourself kind of puts you in a mental state where you may actually be more aware of some of the ways that you do contribute to your social problems. Low self-esteem may kind of allow us to take a more 
brutal, but in some cases more accurate look at our own behavior or our abilities. And this can be an adaptive response to loss, failure, or rejection that can allow us to actually solve the problems with ourselves that created that situation. And the low energy symptoms of depression can also potentially be explained by a need to avoid social conflict. So again, responses like this in our ancestral environment were probably adaptive after some kind of interpersonal setback like bereavement, like interpersonal rejection, like a loss of status within your social group. Um, another potentially sort of adaptive time to feel sadness and to engage in these behaviors was during times of physical scarcity. So for example, depressive symptoms are more common in people who are menstruating, um, in people who just gave birth and during the winter. And we'll talk about that in the next couple slides. But first, so one way that we can say that a behavior is universal or an emotion is universal is that we can look at it cross-culturally in humans, or we can look at it across situation in humans and we can say that the average human would feel sad in response to a given situation. Many behaviors that are conserved and adaptive in humans didn't originate in humans. Um, they were shared with a much earlier common ancestor. So there's evidence that some types of animals, particularly animals that live a long time or animals that live in close social groups, engage in behaviors that kind of look like grieving when members of their groups die. For social animals like rats, for example, loneliness, being kept in an isolated cage can cause signs of stress like appetite loss or um, signs of anxiety. It can be, cause them to become more susceptible to physical illness and it can cause them to engage or to seem kind of lethargic and fatigued. What I'm gonna show you in this video is an actual research paradigm that's used to kind of create depression in rats. This is a way of studying the effects of antidepressant drugs in animal trials. So what I'm going to show you is what's known as the social defeat paradigm, where a test subject, a rat or a mouse, is essentially bullied by a larger, stronger, higher status rat or mouse. Repeated social defeat for these social animals results in a set of behaviors including grooming themselves less, not taking care of their sleeping area, not keeping their cages clean, sleeping more, eating more, sometimes eating less and in showing signs of anxiety. All of these things are comparable, although obviously not directly the same thing as human depressive symptoms. So the black mouse is the test subject and the larger white mouse is a socially dominant, aggressive female who's bullying her. This is supposed to kind of mimic the loss of status or repeated stress that can trigger human depression. So over time, after repeatedly being exposed to this paradigm, we would expect that mouse to start showing signs of what looks a lot like sadness and even depression. So as I mentioned, in our ancestral environment, it may have been adaptive to engage in behaviors that look like depression, sleeping more, eating more or eating less, um, having low energy, not doing as many things during times of physical depletion. So two examples of times when our ancestors might have experienced physical depletion and scarcity were winter and during menstruation. And even today, these are two time periods when humans are more susceptible to mood symptoms and specifically depressive symptoms. So a separate diagnosis from major depressive disorder that was newly added to the DSM is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is distinct from major depressive disorder because effective symptoms are limited to the week right before menstruation. And they have to improve during the week after menstruation and be absent for some period of time during a person's cycle. Similar to depression, there's a combination of physical effect, sorry, effective emotional symptoms like mood swings, irritability or anger, depressed mood, feeling tense and on edge, and more physical slash cognitive symptoms. Very similar to anhedonia, loss of interest in activities, changes in appetite, changes in energy level, sleeping more, sleeping less, difficulty concentrating. Um, in the case of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, 
physical symptoms of menstruation can also be applied to the diagnosis. So PMDD can be very difficult to distinguish from both typical premenstrual symptoms and also from depression. This is an example of prospective diagnosis. So following people over time being really critical. It's because premenstrual dysphoric disorder can really only be diagnosed in this phase right before the period starts. And it has to improve during this phase and be pretty absent during the majority of ovulation, so the fertile window, and most of the luteal phase until the body starts preparing to menstruate again. When you ask people who menstruate if they experience symptoms of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, about 6% of people will report that they do. Um, that's an example of retrospective report. However, when you actually follow people throughout their cycle, only about 2% meet diagnostic criteria for premenstrual dysphoric disorder based on the exact timing of their effective symptoms. Um, it's actually a relatively uncommon diagnosis because it's not typically diagnosed in someone who has a co-occurring mood disorder, even though you can have depression and then have worsening depression with a different um, pre precipitating factor on top of your depression. It's typically not diagnosed in someone with existing depression. Another example of depressive symptoms that are more common during time periods when ancestrally we would have been experiencing depleted resources is seasonal affective disorder. And whereas premenstrual dysphoric disorder is a separate diagnosis from major depression, seasonal affective disorder is considered a type of major depression or just a manifestation of major depressive disorder. So seasonal affective disorder or SAD is a recurrent form of major depressive disorder that follows a seasonal pattern where people experience their worst symptoms in the darker months. So this is an example of a prospective study of patients with seasonal affective disorder who were followed for two years. They were consistently assessed every month and asked to report on when, how much they were socializing, they were weighed to see if they were gaining weight, they were asked when they were eating the most and they were asked when they were sleeping the most across a 12 month calendar year. And almost universally, these people who have a seasonal pattern to their depression feel a lot better during the summer months and start to feel worse and worse with typically their worst month being nominated as January and all of their um, depressive symptoms kind of peaking around the same time. Seasonal affective disorder tends to have ato sorry, atypical symptoms. So as opposed to melancholic symptoms, which really focus on kind of a loss of pleasure, it's often kind of flat affect, difficulty feeling happy and really severe insomnia and things like appetite loss. Seasonal affective disorder has the opposite symptom pattern. Hypersomnia, having a really hard time waking up in the morning, napping a lot during the day, fatigue, having an increased appetite and experiencing weight gain. And this is what's being shown in this pattern of um, symptom trajectories. So seasonal affective disorder doesn't occur in regions where there isn't a pretty significant seasonal shift in the amount of daylight that happens between the summer and the winter. So in places closer to the equator, um, not exactly including any region in the United States except for Southern Florida, um, but yeah, I'm sorry, in regions closer to the equator, seasonal affective disorder doesn't really exist because there isn't enough yearly fluctuation in light exposure. Seasonal affective disorder is actually very common and it's much more common in northern um, regions. So it's very common in Alaska, Scandinavia. Um, it's higher in North America and Europe compared to South America. Interestingly, indigenous populations in these areas, so Native Americans, um, indigenous people in Scandinavia, have much lower rates of seasonal affective disorder than people who migrated to those areas more recently. This is possibly a combination of selection. So living in people were selected for living in those areas. People who could tolerate these changes in sun exposure without becoming depressed were more likely to settle in these areas. This is not evidence of um, evolutionary pressures because the time course is too short. It, the ancestors of indigenous people came to those areas too recently for um, evolution to be the explanation. So really it's probably more selection not everyone can handle living in such extreme northern climates and the people who can handle it the most are the ones who are more likely to stay there and um, reproduce there. The other piece though is culture. 
So indigenous cultures tend to have ways of helping people cope with these dark months. And people who are immigrating from other cultures don't have those same traditions and so may have a harder time coping. Even in people who don't meet full criteria for depression during the winter months, it's very common for people to say that their mood is relatively lower during the winter months. So on top of that three to 10% prevalence of full-blown depression in the winter, 10 to 20% more people say that they tend to feel sad or experience winter blues in the winter. This is likely because our mood is one of the many bodily functions that's regulated by our circadian system. The circadian system, it refers to daily rhythmic fluctuations in neurotransmitter and hormone production. That is what's known as entrained to the sun. So our body is able to sense the, the level of light and figure out what time of day it is based on the position of the sun in the sky. And the position of the sun in the sky helps our body to regulate production of the hormones and neurotransmitters that influence our mood, influence our appetite, influence our energy level, and influence our mental alertness. The circadian cycle is most implicated in control of sleep. So um, the way that the circadian cycle helps to control sleep is that as darkness approaches, our body begins to produce more melatonin, which is a hormone that helps us to um, enter a sleep state. As daylight approaches, our body stops producing melatonin. And when we're exposed to light in the morning, this actually suppresses our melatonin production and helps us be more alert and less likely to fall asleep during the day. This is an, an example of the importance of sunlight and helps to explain why people who experience seasonal affective disorder often report that one of their biggest problems is waking up in the morning. So seasonal affective disorder does actually have a specific etiology. We kind of understand the drivers of seasonal affective disorder a little bit better than we understand the drivers of major depressive disorder as a whole. For most human beings, less light exposure translates to worse mood. And this is because our circadian cycle is, produce, is um, so influenced by the amount of light exposure that we have. Light suppresses melatonin production. Melatonin helps to regulate our sleep onset. So again, help us fall asleep and duration. It helps to control how long we stay asleep. A majority of people who have seasonal affective disorder show signs of melatonin dysfunction. Their circadian cycle is not as good at adjusting to changes in light exposure. So they have more trouble falling asleep and waking up because their internal body clock isn't catching up to the um, amount of light that they're being exposed to. In people who are vulnerable to depression, too much melatonin in their system is thought to precipitate depressive symptoms. Sleep disturbances themselves can often precipitate the onset of depression. So when people are consistently sleep deprived, even for reasons that aren't related to light exposure or even related to stress, this can trigger an episode of depression. And alterations in sleep, including sleeping too much and sleeping too little, is often the first symptom that people notice of seasonal affective disorder. So seasonal affective disorder, because it has its own specific known etiology, has a specific treatment. Exposure to bright light in the morning helps to regulate circadian cycles. It does this by suppressing melatonin production. So when someone lives in a Northern climate and in the winter is having to try to wake up in the dark because of the the amount of light exposure that northern climates get in the winter, they can help to try to regulate their melatonin production by exposing themselves to artificial bright light to help their body suppress melatonin production, allow themselves to feel more alert and um, less likely to fall asleep during the day. We know that this mechanism is specific to melatonin production because clinical trials have actually compared bright light therapy in the morning to bright light therapy in the evening for seasonal affective disorder. Bright light therapy in the morning is an effective treatment for seasonal affective disorder, whereas bright light therapy in the evening is no more effective than a placebo. Because of this, bright light therapy is probably the first line treatment for seasonal affective disorder. But we know that when bright light therapy is combined with cognitive behavioral therapy, which we're gonna talk about in the next lecture, the positive effects are longer lasting and people are less likely to have a recurrence the next winter. There's some mixed evidence of the efficacy of bright light therapy for non-seasonal depression. And there's some thought that for some people, depression is still a problem with circadian regulation, um, even 
not in the winter. So the reason I just kind of detoured into talking about seasonal affective disorder and premenstrual, premenstrual dysphoric disorder is because these disorders may help to shed some light on the evolutionary origins of depressive-like behavior that isn't precipitated by a major stressor, loss, or life event. Depressive behaviors, illness behaviors, may have evolved and been conserved because they helped our ancestors conserve resources in times of scarcity. And again, these are things like hypersomnia, alterations in appetite, alterations in energy level, and even changes in our mood. When we're feeling sad or not feeling a lot of pleasure in things, we're less likely to go out and expend energy or take risks. Okay, so getting back to this idea of depression as an overextension of normal sadness, just like anxiety disorders are an overextension of normal anxiety and fear response responses. Researchers like Wakefield and Darubis have argued that depression is overdiagnosed, that our diagnostic criteria are bad at distinguishing between sadness in response to a stressful life event and true major depressive disorder. But we can't ignore the fact that in many, many cases, particularly for first episodes of depression, major depressive episodes are often precipitated by stress, losses, or loneliness, exactly the kind of situations that we talked about resulting in normal adaptive sadness. So the ideological model for depression that I'd like to end this lecture with is this. Predisposing factors, including circadian dysregulation and including proneness to negative affect, so the tendency to feel sadness more often, more strongly, and with less cognitive control, in combination with precipitating factors, including stress, loss, and loneliness, leads to the feeling of normal sadness and adaptive depression symptoms that, again, everyone would feel in response to chronic stress, losses, and breakups, loneliness. However, for some people, this normal sadness persists and lasts even beyond the resolution of the stress or longer than most people would take to kind of recover from the loss. What happens when normal sadness turns into depression probably happens through perpetuating factors, cognitive and behavioral tendencies, individual differences, habits and responses to stress and, stress and sadness that make stress and sadness last longer and turn it into major depressive disorder. And that is gonna be the main topic of our next lecture. We're gonna really cover perpetuating factors as well as predisposing factors. So to sum it up, the way that we define depression now, it's just not categorically different from normal sadness. One way that we can help to differentiate the two is looking at severity, chronicity, and recurrence. Another way that we can look at it is whether the symptoms are in response to a stressor that would produce adaptive sadness in most people. However, as I just said on the previous slide, for some people with sufficient predisposing risk factors or who experience perpetuating influences like certain styles of thinking, normal sadness that's precipitated by loss can develop into depression. Depression can also be precipitated by things like a lack of sun and physical depletion, which again helps to shed light on its evolutionary origins. There are of course also cases where depression seems to come out of nowhere. This can be due to someone just having a very high um, level of predisposing factors, a really strong tendency to feel sadness, a really poor ability to regulate sadness. Or what's most often the case, depression that comes out of nowhere tends to be a recurrence of depression. So when depression recurs, even in the absence of a typical stressful life event, often perpetuating factors that we're going to discuss in the next lecture are to blame. Okay, whoops, sorry, it's not gonna be the next lecture. So in the next lecture, we're gonna kind of go back into um, the influences of social context on people's experiences of depression and mood symptoms. We're gonna go into depth on what's known as the deaths of despair theory, which was proposed by prominent sociologists Anne Case and Angus Deaton. In this lecture, we're also going to discuss suicide, suicidal ideation and how to prevent suicide. In the lecture after that, we'll get into the ideological model of major depression, focusing mostly on predisposition and perpetuation. So how um, people are vulnerable to depression and how normal sadness turns into depression or how depression can seem to come out of nowhere. All right, that is that.